and thank you for the invitation. Can, can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you, Professor. Okay. Well, thank you for the invitation. Good morning for me, good afternoon for you. Um, again, thank you for the invitation. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, one second. Can you see my slide? Yeah, yeah you can see. Excellent, excellent. Wow. And during the next 30 to 40 minutes, uh, I'm going to talk about a very interesting disease for people in the neurology and neurosurgery world. Um, but before anything, I really need to do a couple of disclaimers. First one is whatever I'm going to show you is not personal work. We have a very, very large multi-institution, multidisciplinary network working in cystic psychosis research that we call the cystic psychosis working group in Peru. You can see a picture of the group in the slide. Um, this is all people from different backgrounds and uh, we have neurologists, neurosurgeons, veterinarians, epidemiologists, biologists, even crazy people doing mathematical modeling of transmission or vaccine development or modeling of molecules in, in situ. Uh, so it's all uh, a crew of crazy people working together and producing a lot of information on this disease. Uh, so the credit is from the group where I'm just the presenter of the world that most of these people has done. And the second important disclaimer for this presentation is that I am not a neurosurgeon at all. So please uh, forgive me if I say crazy things in the neurosurgical part, but I will do my best. So I began by saying that um, cystic psychosis is a very interesting neurological disease. But actually that is a wrong affirmation. Uh, cystic psychosis is an infectious disease, more than a neurological disease. And that has created a lot of confusion during the years because people was focusing on cystic psychosis as a neurological disease when it's actually an infection. And as such, there is a huge spectrum that goes from exposure to the parasite without the infection to asymptomatic infection, to mild infections, to severe infections, to death, including infections outside of the, of the central nervous system. So if you count the entire world, cystic psychosis is clearly the main cause of acquired epilepsy. And by acquired epilepsy, I mean late onset epilepsy, beginning after age 15, 20, but also, a very important thing is cystic psychosis is present in all poor regions of the world because of the coexistence of pig racing, domestic pig racing, and poor sanitation. You can see in this picture five pigs in a village in the highlands of Cusco in Peru eating straightforward from the open sewage coming from two houses. Pure Muslim societies don't have cystic psychosis. But mixed countries with Muslim majorities, but other minorities, they do have cystic psychosis even despite being uh, in the media all the time. This is the current WHO map of cystic psychosis risk. Uh, this is WHO, so it has to be wrong. Most of these gray areas are actually of transmission uh, there is transmission in several of those gray areas. And just to give you an example, in South America, we have Chile and Argentina clear of transmission where we know that in the highlands of North Chile and North Argentina, there is local transmission of cystic psychosis. So you can see it's not only the tropical belt, it's in way above the tropical belt, above and below the tropical belt. Uh, and Wherever it is present, it will be part of the burden of neurological disease, particularly seizures, late onset seizures, and intracranial hypertension. We'll get to that in a second. This is the life cycle of tinea solium, 
which is um, which is the classic cycle of a complex parasite. These parasites have a worm in the intestine of the tumor or the definitive host, which is usually a carnivore, and larvae in the flesh of an intermediate host, which is usually, usually a herbivore. So, you know, carnivore eats the larvae in the flesh of the intermediate host and develop the tapeworm. The tapeworm expels eggs, infected eggs with the stools, and those go to the environment and the herbivore, um, the herbivore gets infected by ingesting the eggs and developing the larva. So the definitive host does the next tenaiosis, the intermediate host makes cystic psychosis. And everything will be a happy party if we were not able to do cystic psychosis. But unfortunately, in this audience, unlike this aginata or others, humans can be intermediate host and become infected with cystic psychosis, not only with the niacin. A few pictures so we get acquainted with the enemy. The lower part, uh, the lower piece of pork, you can see it's filled with cysts. Uh, with the white dots correspond to the head of the parasite, which is uh, in the inside of the cyst. Uh, let me see. Here we have the cyst dissected and put in a petri dish. You can see these are bags of parasitic membrane containing the head of the parasite, which is the white dot. These are macroscopic, it's approximately one centimeter. And when this is ingested in the flesh, the head of the table gets out, imaginates, hangs from the intestinal mucus, and from this head of scolex, it develops a full table. The full table in this volume measures between two and four meters. And a very interesting characteristic of the cestodes is that they develop as units of bricks or proglorids. So as new proglorids are formed at the neck region, the older proglorids get more and more distal, and as you will understand, distal proglottids are the more mature proglottids. Now, this is a hermaphroditic worm. Uh, so it has fully developed male and female seven, uh, reproductive system. And it lives in the darkness of the intestine alone with nothing else to do. So at some point, the worm gets um, excited and has sex with itself and gets pregnant. So the final proglorids are what we call gravid proglorids, which are these two in the right of the slide. And the gravid proglorids are completely occupied by the uterus of the parasites. What, why do I bring you all of this boring biology? Because in these proglorids with the uterus and the eggs, we can have 30 to 50,000 infected eggs each of which can become a cyst with your patient's head. So the transmission potential of this parasite is enormous. And the eggs, you may have seen this when you studied medicine. This is the picture of what you see in the stools. And this is electron microscope showing you a thick collagenous cover to protect it from the environment. And the embryo, which is slightly larger than a red cell. That probably explains why cystic psychosis gets through the filters of the liver and the lung and gets disseminated to all tissue, while hydatid, which has a slightly larger embryo, gets mostly filtered in the liver and the lung. So this is the cycle again. And what we are going to focus today is mostly in the tip of the iceberg, symptomatic human cystic psychosis. Oh. Clinical expression of cystic psychosis depends on several factors. How many parasites are in that brain? Where are they? Are they large, small? Are one, 20, 50? Are they inflamed? Are they alive? Are they dead? And one more interesting part is whether they are parenchymal cysts or extraparenchymal cysts, which behave differently. So with all of these factors, you can expect basically any neurological symptom. As I said a minute ago, the classical presentation of late onset epilepsy, chronic headache, and intracranial hypertension. 
there are two major types of cystic cellulitis. When the phagocyte is located in the parenchyma of the brain, its growth is restricted and it forms a cyst, a rounded cyst, which eventually it's detected by the immune system of the host, becomes a granuloma or what the literature calls an enhancing lesion, and then disappears or calcifies. And this may happen in months or it may happen after 10 or 20 years. This is the same thing with pictures. You can see the cyst here, an inflammatory nodule, and then the calcification. Uh, better resolution pictures. Here you see the scoreless in the, in the insular cyst and in the right uh, occipital cyst. And you can also see that the parenchyma around the cyst looks perfectly healthy. There's a great homeostasis between the parasite and the host. Here are a couple of the small cysts in, on CT. And now in this one, we see two things that are different. First, it's enhancing with contrast, meaning that the blood brain barrier has been broken. There's inflammation here, and you can see that the left occipital is darker with the edema. So the host has found this parasite, it's triggering a cellular inflammatory response, and it's trying to kill it, and it will end up killing it and collapsing it into an enhancing lesion or granuloma. As uh, you can see another one here uh, with the edema around it. And eventually it will disappear or leave a calcified or calcified scar. Some patients come with hundreds of thousands of cysts. And it's important that you recognize this because here the problem when they have this encephalitis-like presentation with edema and inflammation, the problem here is the massive inflammation. And if you come in with antiparasitic drugs and attack this parasite and liberate more antigen, you will generate more inflammation and you may kill this patient. So in this encephalitis like syndrome by cystic cell causes, the problem is inflammation and the target, immediate target is this inflammation. We also see patients with hundreds of cysts with very little traces of inflammation living an almost normal life with a seizure uh, every once in a while. And these patients um, are probably those who survive the encephalitis, the encephalitis, the encephalitis uh, stage. So that's for parenchyma cystic cell cause. But when the cyst is outside the parenchyma, in the extraparenchymal space, particularly when they are in the subarachnoid space, two bad things happen at the same time. One is it grows. The membrane grows and expands and infiltrates and takes the spaces, the surrounding spaces, blocks the circulation of CSF and causes hydrocephalus and mass effects. And the second one is there is a lot of inflammation because it's not anymore protected by the blood brain barrier. So this patient may come with a CSF with more than one gram of proteins, lots of cells, and characteristically eosinophilus. And the problem here is mostly mass effects, intracranial hypertension, and hydrocephalus. Another, uh, another set of pictures, you can see a cyst in the ventricle. You can see this is a cluster of parasitic membrane in the, uh, in the ciliar tissue behaving as a slow-growing tumor. You can see the inline deviation. And this is the worst. When it is in the baseline and the basal system, this is what the old literature used to call racism of cystic cell causes because it looks like a bunch of grapes. It's not individual cysts, it's just liquid trapped in a membrane of magma. This is a pathology picture. You can see the whole extensive arachnoid iris. And these things that look like individual cysts are part of a complex of parasitic membrane trapping some cyst fluid or CSF. So in a couple of minutes, we have seen like 10 or uh, 10 patients, and each of them, it's a different uh, clinical presentation. And they have different diagnostic approaches and different therapeutic approaches and different prognosis. So we prefer to talk about the neurocystic psychosis in plural rather than cystic psychosis as a single entity. 
Before we get into diagnosis and treatment, uh, let me just say a few things. What we see in places like Peru or China or Africa or other parts of Latin America, it's lots of cystic cystic cirrhosis, significant numbers of pseudorhinal cystic cirrhosis, and, uh, and occasionally massive infections, granulomas, and some patients around 10% will carry a table. But when you look at different populations, like in children, even here, uh, the spectrum is very different. Children mostly present with a single enhancing nodule in the brain, very rarely multiple cysts, uh, and it's more frequent to find the table, which makes sense because they have been infected in a probably a uh, nearer time than an adult that could who have been infected 10 or 15 years ago and the table may have died. But when you look at India, the Indian subcontinent has a very interesting spectrum of disease, which is very similar to what we see in children here. 90% of their cases are teenagers, children or young teenagers with a single enhanced infection. Very rarely they find a table. And when you look at the literature in travelers, people who get infected by travelers to an endemic region, the spectrum is very similar. On the contrary, if you go to Europe, UK, or the States, and look at long-term immigrants, what you see is subarachnoid cystic cirrhosis and established parenchymal cystic cirrhosis. So why, why do I bring it up? Because what we think it happens is that normally the evolution of the infection should be what happens in children in India and in travelers. A mild exposure to the parasite is overcome by the immune system and the infection dies in early stages with a very benign prognosis. However, what we see here in places where there is a lot of infection pressure, it's repeated exposures or heavily exposures that establish as a multiple cyst infections and survive for many years and cause uh, multi-cystic cystic cirrhosis or subarachnoid cystic cirrhosis. So we are talking about two different presentations of the disease. Just a couple of words to say that the cyst may be in the eye. You can see a cyst floating freely in the vitreum of this patient. You can even see the scoliosis of the cyst at the light of the thermoscope. Um, in the Moscow, you can see the cyst normally as calcification, <clears throat> usually as a chance finding because somebody had a problem with the, with the traumatic uh, trauma in the leg or something. And one interesting thing here is that the parasites look like cigars because they die blasted by the pressure of the muscle bundle instead of dying uh, in the brain where they look like fungal calcifications. So, how do we diagnose cystic cirrhosis? <laughs> My friend Oscar Del Bruno in Ecuador put up a chart of diagnostic criteria 26 years ago in 1996 that initially was for cystic cirrhosis, then it moved it to neurocystic cirrhosis. And in the last version published in 2017, the focus of the diagnosis is neuroimaging. <clears throat> <clears throat> the summary here is you should diagnose cystic cirrhosis by neuroimaging and confirm it with serology. And in terms of neuroimaging, we have CT and MRI. The recommendation is ideally to use both, but in poor society, people cannot access to it. So a good CT will give you most of the diagnosis, but you have to watch out because it would miss a small lesions, particularly those in the posterior fossa or those close to the, brain, to, the, to the bone. On the other hand, MRI would give you a better imaging of small lesions, but MRI is particularly bad for detecting calcifications. So CT is much better for detecting calcifications. That's why we recommend both if possible. And in terms of serology, there is this test, which is the Western blood or EITD, which was developed at the CDC in Atlanta in 1989, and looks for antibody to seven well-defined antigens of the parasite 
and it's an spectacular test. The problem with the Western blot, as we will see with all other tests in cystic cirrhosis, is that it's poorly available commercially. So it's not easy to access to this test, but whenever available, it's a spectacular test with a very, very high sensitivity and uh, almost complete specificity. Um, but antibodies, what we know now is that more anti antibody bands reflect more severe disease. And I, have seen, I haven't seen a false negative in a patient with more than one cyst. In patients with one cyst or one lesion, EITB may be negative in up to 30% of the cases. And then you have to watch out for the differential there. An antibody is useless for follow-up because it takes years to disappear. But we have this other toy, which is antigen detection. There are a license to detect antigen. And I have to first warn you that these are not the classic commercial ELISAs to detect antibody. Antibody detection ELISAs for parasites are very bad. They have a very high rate of cross reactions with other parasites, including some that are very frequent worldwide, like Canon Olympic Nana, et cetera. This is a test which uses a monoclonal antibody to detect parasite antigen. And it was developed in Scotland and Belgium almost simultaneously in the early 90s or end of the 80s. And it's not as sensitive as the antibody detection because now we are capturing parasite products, not the multiplied antibody, but it's great for follow-up. This is a patient with a very bad basal cystic cirrhosis, which we, who we treated several times, each of the blue columns is a course of antiparasitic treatment. And the black dotted line is the area of the parasite on MRI. And the blue line is composed by antigen detection in the serum, not CSF, in the serum of this patient. Every one of the archive samples was run. And we can see that antigen descends and drops, sorry. Ah, I don't know how to go back one second. And drops by the time that parasite disappears in new remaining. So now we're using this test more and more for the follow-up of our patients. There are now PCRs in the works. There's a promising report on subarachnoid cystic cirrhosis, but so far in sensitivity in parenchymal cystic cirrhosis, where we have most of the Diagnostic doubt is not being demonstrated. So again, cystic cirrhosis should be diagnosed by imaging and supported by serology, and the assets of choice are Western blood and antigen ELISA. Again, also poorly available, unfortunately. And now we get into treatment. Treatment of cystic cirrhosis <coughs> is a passion item. Up to late 70s, there was no specific treatment for neurocystic cirrhosis. And this is not a new disease. This disease was well described in the literature since the late 800, 1800s or the early 1900s, but there was no treatment for cystic cirrhosis. Only steroids, antiepileptics, surgery, or necrosis. By that time, um, a uh, veterinarian in Mexico, Dr. Um, Chavarria, was working with pigs with schistosomiasis, and he gave this, this pigs prasiquantia. And when he killed the pigs, he found dead schistosomiasis and dead cysticercus. So he went to the field, bowed infected pigs, gave them prasiquantia, and again, the cysts died. So he went to a friend of him, a neurosurgeon, and um, they treated a kid hospitalized in Mexico DF, and the kid improved. The case was published in 1979, and they said, we now have a drug that kills the parasite. Dog is dead, rabies is over. 
Unfortunately, as always in life, things are not so simple. And when people began to use Plasiquante worldwide, some patients began to have very bad reactions at day two, three, four, five of the treatment, particularly status epilepticus, seizures, and intracranial hypertension. So very quickly, people familiar with the disease, particularly the Brazilian group, interpret this as an inflammatory reaction to the death of the parasite or to aggression to the parasite and added steroids, uh, prednisone or dexamethasone, or in India they use prednisone, and that modulates the inflammation and allows the treatment to continue without major side effects. But this triggered a cash discussion in the world people who was in favor of killing the parasite with antiparasitic drugs and people who was against using antiparasitic drugs because of the risk of, the, of side effects and death. If we look at the literature, as expected, you will see faster resolution of the parasite in radiology in people receiving uh, antiparasitic drugs. And now the evidence is accumulating that you will have a better control of seizures if you kill all the parasites with antiparasitic drugs. So um, if you look at the other spectrum of the disease, people with a single enhancing vision, the radiological advantage of using antiparasitic drugs is not that evident, but when you look at seizures in these same cohorts, you have this homogeneous meta-analysis showing a benefit of fewer seizures in people who receive an antiparasitic drug plus steroids. And so it makes it a recommendation. We don't really know whether this is the effect of immunomodulation by the steroids or antiparasitic effect by albendas or prasequante, but in general, these people, when they are treated, they have fewer seizures in the follow-up. So we now tend to think that most of patients will benefit with antiparasitic drugs, but it's something that you have to decide in a case-by-case -case basis. In recent years, we have done a few series of studies that are interesting also, adding prasequante plus albendazol results in more killing of the parasite without increasing side effects. If we give more steroids during the initial weeks or months, we get a better evolution of seizures in that period. And there are now uh, US guidelines from the Infectious Disease and Tropical Medicine Society, which recommend uh, antiparasitic drugs in most cases, except in intraventricular and cystic circular encephalitis. Um, where they advocate for antiparasitic or neuroendoscopy. And then I was telling you that the worst is when it's in the basal systems. In this type of cystic sarcosis, something curious is that the spine, subarachnoid space, it's infiltrated by cystic sarcosis in up to 65% of the patients, two thirds of the patients, will show cystic sarcosis in the spine. This is so far a uh, finding. They don't, they don't present symptoms in the majority of cases. And by the time you kill the cerebral cystic psychosis, you have killed the spinal cystic psychosis. But this probably explains why 40 years ago, we used to see these patients with chronic hydrocephalus, um, quadriparitions, blind, uh, postrated in the, in the chronic hospitals in endemic regions. And a final word, a dead parasite, even after calcifications, even years after calcifications, may show significant edema. These are two different patients. And these are MRIs taken at the time of a seizure, a few hours or days after a seizure. <clears throat> and you can see a gross area of edema that wanes around uh, after a few weeks. This was noted first in Canada and then in the States. And we did a cohort with a patient with calcifications 
And we did an MRI by, a, by the time a patient had a seizure. And at the same time, we did a control matched by age, sex, and number of calcifications who had no seizures. And from 23 or 24 cases, half of the cases had visible edema by the time of the seizure. And only two of 24 controls had edema. And this one in the right side had a seizure a couple of weeks later. So there is a strong association between edema around the calcification and seizures, but we still don't know whether this is chicken or egg, whether it's seizures around the calcification breaking the blood brain barrier and triggering edema, or whether this is an immune reaction triggering edema and edema triggering a seizure. Uh, another advance in recent years is the advent of steady state MRI techniques. This, those are called Fiesta, CISS, or BFFE, depending on the brand of the machine, but they gave you a spectacular definition of uh, images in the liquid spaces. You can see in this porencephalic cavity, the cyst here with the scolex. And finally, there are more and more literature accumulating in the last 10 years that chronic calcified cystocercosis may be associated with hypocampal atrophy and sclerosis, particularly in elder people, uh, older people. Uh, so here, cysticercosis will likely act on the initial precipitant injury and uh, develop either an inflammatory or um, degenerative process that ends up with um, hypocampal sclerosis years later. This not necessarily happens when the parasite is in the hippocampus. <clears throat> it may happen with parasites distant to the hippocampus. And now um, I'm going to take a, a break and get into your field, which is a field in which I am not familiar with, but I dare to put up a few slides with the surgical aspects of neurocystic causes. Uh, in my view, the parts of concern to neurosurgery are shunt implantation, take-out cysts, reset an epileptogenic foci associated to cysticercosis, or biopsy lesion that looks like cysticercosis but maybe a malignancy or a different thing. When we talk about shunts, in endemic areas, we usually uh, witness a fight between surgeons and clinicians. Surgeons want the clinicians to give antiparasitic therapy first before putting up the shunt because the parasite products may block the shunt. However, I will say that there is consensus now that what you have to manage is the intracranial hypertension of the patient. So the shunt should be put first and then not wait for the antiparasitic treatment. They may get obstructed, Sometimes steroids may reduce the chance of obstruction. And sometimes patients have a trapped pore ventricle, uh, which may require a second derivation. Then, classically, surgical cystic cercosis was restricted to take out a big single cyst, because those were the only uh, uh, place in which surgery was supposed to be curative. And then with the advent of neuroendoscopy, extraction of ventricular cysts became more and more frequent. And now, more recently, neurosurgeons are considering and entering to debulk large lesions, even if there are multiple lesions, to gain space and gain time for a faster and a smoother response to antiparasitic treatment. So this is the classic cyst that was operated 20, 10 or 20 years ago, you had a patient with a single large cyst. So the surgeon did a craniectomy and next, uh, had the cyst out. And now we have neuroendoscopy. Let me show you this video. This is after the surgeon has fenestrated the basis of the third ventricle. And he is now looking at the systems and the peritruncal space. And you can see all of those parasitic membranes and signs of chronic arachnoiditis. And as he washes, um, we will see it a little bit better. 
you can see this piece of membrane hanging from the from the wall from the pedima and expanding in the ducted there. And that's how it looks in chronic uh, subarachnoid cystic psychosis. You can see the vessels and a clot. And now the surgeon will come in and look at this parasite behind the clot. All of this magma extended mass of parasitic membranes is occupying a space and triggering chronic inflammation. Um, so as, as he washes, you can see the endoscope coming in. He will first try to take out the clot. We can gain a little bit of time here. You can see here, it's a beautiful view of how the subarachnoid cystic cirrhosis looks like in real life. And now the surgeon will come in and pull it out with the endoscope. But you have to be careful because if there is adherence, it may bleed. So bleeding is the enemy of this procedure. Um, and as I say, now, even in patients with multiple fossil of disease, neurosurgeons may come in and extract this large cluster of cysts to have a patient much more stable for anti later antiparasitic treatment. And that's what usually done with open craniotomy, but now they are doing it with neuroendoscopy, stereotaxy, or even microcraniotomy. In our institute, the neurosurgeons are performing this type of microcraniotomy. You can see the whole bore hole is one and a half centimeter, sometimes it's even smaller. And this is entering close to the cilium tissue in a patient who had a mass of parasites in the cilium tissue. So the neurosurgeons here at the Institute are developing this technique, which has a very, very short surgical time uh, from incision to the last stitch. It's most times one hour, one hour 15. Here you can see the parasite showing up after you, you open the, the meninges. And then there's the extraction of the parasite, exploration of the cilium space, and the washing and more extraction of the parasites. One thing that surgeons are uh, commonly worried is whether they break the parasite and they will liberate parasite fluid and that will give more infections or anaphylaxis, like as described or hydatid disease. Well, it doesn't happen in cystic psychosis. Breaking a parasitic cyst during the surgical act doesn't cause a seeding of the disease, and it doesn't cause uh, anaphylaxis or chronic inflammation. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not the best person to explain you what uh, Dr. Vasquez is doing there, but basically what I understand is exploration of the space, very careful exploration of the space with continuous irrigation and uh, extraction of the parasitic membranes, very, very kind, very gently to avoid um, to avoid bleeding. So, as I say, there's more and more space for surgery in neurocystic psychosis. Uh, and I hope in the following years we will have control and information on whether extracting these large parasitic masses will make the evolution of these parasites in the following months of year or in response to antiparasitic therapy. Uh, better in terms of a scarring, in terms of uh, residual hydrocephalus, or in, even in terms of response to antiparasitic anti drugs. So you can see that he keeps exploring and he keeps finding more and more significant uh, pieces of parasite uh, in the in the cilium spaces. Um,
I think it's ending right here. Yep. And then finally, when we uh, talk about extracting an epileptogenic fo focus, we normally think on temporal resection. Uh, in patients who have a uh, temporal epilepsy foci, well defined. But sometimes these patients have additional tissue foci in distant regions of the brain. And there is a couple of papers in the literature that sustain that if you do both resections, you will have better results uh, for tissue remission. And finally, sometimes we have a patient who is, which is not clear. This has been recently published in December 2021 from India. You can see this typical calcification with this atypical edema, completely atypical with midline deviation here. And Dr. Rakshikar in India has said that when there's midline deviation, it's never cystic sarcosis. And his criteria for single enhanced division are very good. But in this particular case, they uh, decided, uh, the patient responded to steroids and they delayed the surgery, they did an MRI, and this image is completely atypical. Uh, you can see this um, cluster of enhancement in heterogeneous configuration. And so I brought the pictures to show you that the presentations may be completely atypical. This patient evolved for good, he didn't have a biopsy, but he would probably have uh, been much educational and much faster diagnosis if he had a needle biopsy of this, of this lesion, because it was completely atypical and very, very rare for cystic sarcosis. So that's all I brought, and I hope you will forgive me my uh, exploration of, the, of your neurosurgical fields. And uh, the final word is that there's only a handful of diseases that are included in the list of diseases that could be eradicated from the face of the earth. Cystic sarcosis is in that list. And we have demonstrated a few years ago that transmission can be interrupted in a very wide area of northern Peru. So I hope in a few years, we will be talking about eradication of cystic sarcosis and not talking about the clinical and neurosurgical aspects of the disease. Uh, thank you, thank you a lot, and I remain at your disposition for any questions. Uh, thank you, Professor, for uh, excellent lecture. Uh, can you step uh, sharing, please? Let me stop sharing my screen. Okay, it's good. Uh, firstly, I want to ask a question. Uh, professor, is there uh, another question in massive disease? Uh, we take some of the lesions uh, with surgically. Does it increase the uh, effectiveness of uh, disease for control of the uh, disease? As I said, uh, normally we only thought of surgery, surgery to take out um, large lesions, unique, single large lesions. Now I see the surgeons coming more and more to take large lesions or lesion clusters, even if there's not the only lesion. And probably, and say probably because we don't have control of the uh, data yet, that will make antiparasitic treatment much smoother because you have lesser risks of intracranial hypertension and herniation, which is one of the dangers of treating large cystic sarcosis lesions with antiparasitic. Thank you, Professor. Uh, professor Tuju uh, says very interesting and informative lecture. Thanks a lot, Professor Garcia. Uh, one, one more question from uh, Dr. Adrian Vasi, Bulgaria. Uh, brilliant lecture. Thank you for this ex excellent presentation, Professor Garcia. And uh, Professor Bektaş Açık Göz says, Thank you very much, Professor Garcia, for the great work and excellent presentation. Uh, from Takashi Kon, uh, thank you for the lecture, uh, for the informative lecture. Uh, from Tokyo, Japan, 
our hospital is close to Tokyo airport, so we should be aware of such details, he said. Uh, Professor Bektaş Açıkgöz uh, has two questions. Uh, he uh, asked, uh, do you irrigate with hypertonic saline after excision of the seed? His first yes, question. Again, again, I am invading foreign territories here. I am not a neurosurgeon. I have never operated a cyst, but I will say that hypertonic saline is not indicated. There is no need, you know, to use hypertonic saline. You can irrigate with normal saline because there is no risk of seeding the infection. There are no embryos in the liquid, and there is no risk for uh, anaphylaxis. It has not been reported in surgical neurosurgery course. So I will not use hypertonic saline. I will use profuse irrigation with normal saline. Thank you, Professor. Uh, from Dr. Selim Bozda, uh, she said, thank you for detailed presentation. Uh, the second question from uh, Dr. Bektaş Açıkgöz, uh, he says, have you ever, uh, have you ever an experience with pituitary location of the seed? We have seen a few. And most of them are being treated with antiparasitic drugs, but there are a few in the literature that were resected uh, surgically. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, there is no more question. Uh, professor Suju, uh, can you say anything? I want to uh, thank again to Professor Garcia for accepting our offer to speak in our conferences. It was a brilliant, informative lecture. Thank you so much again, Professor Garcia. Thank you, everybody. My Good. pleasure. Goodbye. Goodbye.